lot of people don't know what imposter syndrome is. It's that feeling of when you're in a room and um, you feel like you don't belong. You feel like you're not qualified enough to be there. It could be, you know, in, in, your, in the classroom or it could be in the workplace when you're in front of a client and you're, you know, speaking on a one-to-one -one basis with them and they're asking you questions and you're just thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about. And it happens to everyone and it happens to women so much. To me, failure is something that is necessary to be experienced when you're um, when, when you have a goal and you're pursuing something, um, it's a stepping stone towards that. And um, I don't think it's very common for, for, for people to kind of start working towards something and achieve success straight away. Um, and also we all put different definitions of success in our minds. Um, it could be monetary success, it could be happiness, it could be pleasing other people, it could be pleasing our parents. And, um, and I think for me, it's just success is when I feel like I've accomplished something or that I've been able to help someone through something that I've done um, or that I've grown from an experience. And um, I think along that way, you will always experience various types of failures. I mean, we fail every single day and uh, we need to learn to become okay with that because it's not the end of the world, basically. You, you have to just keep pushing through that and using it as, as um, a, a means to learn and to grow from that. So that's kind of my definition. And my experience with failure actually started when I was very young, when I was in school. And I was, I was always told that like getting good grades me meant that you are a success and that not being good in your studies, um, not getting straight A's meant that you're a failure to yourself and to your parents and especially to you know your immigrant parents who've like worked so hard to come out of um, their own difficult situations out of poverty whatever it is having moved country having made something of themselves and then expecting you to they almost say like the least you could do is just like do well in school if we're like paying so much and we've worked so hard um, to put you through this education system and it puts a lot of pressure on first generation immigrant kids because we were kind of like, okay, oh no, I need to you know, be doing really well in subjects that don't come naturally to me or that I'm not enjoying as much. And um, I always thought that, that that was the definition of success was you know, getting good grades. And so I was a straight A student my whole life. Like I worked hard, I did my homework, um, I was the nerd of the class. I was always like slightly awkward, slightly introverted, but at home, like it was not even, you know, well done for getting good grades. It was like, yeah, that's expected of you. And I think that experience made me almost like judge other people who didn't do as well. And obviously I've, I've come a really long way from that to understand that like, that is what I was being told as a kid. And it's not the truth. It's just an opinion or it's just like, an artifact that's created by our society and the situations that our parents or our families are in when they move um, from India to the West. And um, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of where where I was when I was growing up. And um, I then experienced failure firsthand at university. So I had many moments where I was just like, I shouldn't even be here. Why am I here? And um, and going from a straight A student, I started failing my exams a lot. Like I was not doing well in university because I wasn't enjoying it. I was in the wrong place. And I think I just, you know, striving for an engineering degree as someone who inherently was a creative, like I, I was always more creatively inclined. So go into maths and go into physics, which I hated. And I, I just did it because I was like, I need to get into engineering. I need to have a good job. This is what um, society tells me. I need to make my parents proud. I need to make my extended family proud who like don't even see me day to day, right? Um, and why am I living for, for other people's expectations? So I think our society is very, very um, strongly focused on caring about what other people think. And I think like for us, failure sort of is such a taboo because of that. Um, we're scared of admitting that we're not good at something or we're scared to admit that we're in you know, the wrong place or we're not doing well. Um, just because you, you know, do really well in school doesn't mean you're, you're gonna 
continue doing so. And so for me, that was the first like slap on my face. It was like, no, that is not like w what real life is. You're not always going to be kind of growing and growing and like working hard and things are going to work out your way because truth be told, sometimes you work really hard towards something and it still doesn't work out because it's not meant to be right. And you just have to keep going and like try different things because maybe you're pursuing the wrong thing. And so at the time I was like, no, I'm not going to quit. To put it bluntly, I think that our society places a lot of importance on grades and it's because they care about the, the outward appearance of things. And being able to brag about your kids' grades is something that, I mean, parents have been doing for generations. They've been comparing their kids to like their friends' kids and being like, oh, but my son, my daughter did this and like got an A in this. And it's just like, it's like such a talking topic in like social events. And um, I think an unnecessary amount of um, pressure and importance is placed on that when the education system in itself is, is quite flawed in the way that they teach kids because they put hundreds of kids in the same room learning at the same pace when everybody has a different pace of learning. So, um, so I think that it can be very scarring for, for kids and for their mental health and it deteriorates without them even realizing because they're constantly striving for this thing that they think is success. But if they're just not well equipped enough to to actually reach that point, then they will set themselves for failure and they will fail. Because if you're putting the failure, the definition of failure as that, then you are definitely going to fail. So for a really long time, I did let that idea of, oh my gosh, I'm failing to really consume me. And what I learned from that, I think, especially from my university experience, I learned that like, you just you can keep pushing forward and um, you can make changes in your life and um, I think what I was doing at that time actually experiencing those failures was making me unlearn my values that I'd learned as a kid of um, this is what success is and this is what failure is and you're ashamed to the family if you're a failure and I mean I've not even experienced like the the most extreme of cases I've I've heard from other people um, the kind of things that they've had to deal with, you know, in terms of grades and um, expectations from families. But, but I think that um, fast forwarding a little bit to, to when I was applying for jobs, for example, um, I got rejected from 48 places and I applied to 50. Um, I, well, either got rejected, um, either did the interview um, and didn't get it, or I just didn't hear back from them. And what I realized from that was I just needed one place to accept me so I could start. Right. So those failures were not saying that, oh, you're you failed in life. It was just like, OK, next one. Right. I've grown from this. What have I learned from this? Right. Let me apply that to the next one. And eventually you're kind of climbing that ladder. And then eventually you get to the end where you've gathered enough experience to. To suddenly like hit that jackpot, you know, one day someone will employ you. So um, it's a you know real life example for me, but it can apply to anything. I mean, uh, as a dancer, I fail every day. So. I go to I go into a class and I fail to remember the routine. I fail to execute it, but I keep going because you're in that space where you're learning and failure is not failure. It's just growth. So, so yeah, that's um, it's a stepping stone to success. It's not the end of your life. And I think I've gone through like a really, really tough time mentally from kind of that unlearning process at uni where I didn't like my course and I was bad at it. And I was just like, should I just leave? Should I give up? And then there were so many pressures of like, well, what are people going to say? Like, oh, uh, you know, I can't just go back home. Like people are going to be like, she probably partied too hard or, you know, she probably drank too much. And, um, and it's just like, it's the, the perception is just all over the place and it's nothing to do with the reality. So, um, so I think that process was, so gut-wrenching it was like pulling out something that was so deep inside me that was like this is what failure is and you're failing and you're, you're, like, you your life is over or whatever to being like no i no longer believe in that because like it's not true for me anyway it's not true and um i'm so much happier for it because since then that wasn't even the worst like when i was applying for jobs it was a lot worse because you're dealing with like daily rejections but you're getting stronger from that and I don't think that feeling upset by it is a bad thing, but you have to kind of reset and just like get back up from that experience and be like, I'm not going to stop because like 
life's too short to kind of just give up on things and you just have to keep going. If you really believe in something, it's just finding that thing that you want to work towards and you'll face daily rejections in that, but you just have to keep trying. I think it comes down to a lack of communication and you have to build that over time. Like I've probably reached a point with my family or my immediate family, so my mum and dad, where I have spent years like trying to break through that little, that generation gap. And I think it's, it comes from both sides. So they have to be willing to break that barrier as well as yourself. And you both have to be working towards it. You'll never get to the same point where you're like both exactly in agreement of each other, but you can keep working at bridging that gap as much as possible. So it, for me, it comes down to communication. It comes down to talking about your feelings. Um, but I'm fortunate that I guess my family is able to understand my struggles. Having moved from India, they, they knew that they had to change their mentality. Things, weren't, things were no longer the way that they were back in India, you know, 30 years ago for them. Um, we've all moved forward. We now live in a digital age where things happen so fast and um, everyone kind of is just trying to adapt to that. So um, fortunately, my parents have reached a point where like they are willing to make that connection with me and try and understand where I'm coming from. And I understand that not everyone has understanding families like that. So, so it's really about like kind of gauging how much you can get through to them. But I still firmly believe that everyone can, to an extent, get through to their parents. They just have to give them a chance. Maybe sometimes we just don't try and we don't communicate enough and we don't talk about our feelings because we think that we automatically assume what they're going to say back to us. But I think that they are also, they're changing with the times too. And um, they're probably not the same people they were when we were teenagers, for example. Um, they've seen a lot of things happen around them as well that have made them think differently about the world. And so we, we definitely need to keep working on that. If I was fear, and what would you say to fear? <laughs> I'd say you're an yeah. <laughs> um, I I'd say that like you, you're most welcome to, to be around because I think you're necessary. But I, I shouldn't let you stop me from doing anything. Like, I can, I can have you standing there on the side just being present because I think to a certain extent being nervous and being fearful sometimes is a good thing. It makes you value things. In our culture, we are so used to like this, this idea of living in big families and like being really close to our relatives and like South Asian families are so rich in just like numbers, right? And, um, and I think when that happens, naturally there is a bit of a a bit of pressure to kind of be able to answer to people that you're interacting with. And because people are so intertwined in their daily lives, and it's not just like, you know, Christmas time where people get together. Like often, I mean, it's different now and it's different for immigrant families, I think. But even with immigrant families, like they have, um, they have their societies, they have the little, little cliques that they form because they, they are looking for comfort, you know, away from home. And so what happens is that um, when they meet each other regularly, they'll just naturally like talk about, you know, how their kids are doing. They have nothing better really to do a lot of the time. And um, a, a lot of it, I think, is, is kind of women are guilty of doing that, of like um, gossiping a lot and getting together in their groups of, of females and just like talking about everyone and everything because often a lot of them don't work and um, a lot of them kind of don't have much going on in their own lives and so unfortunately they they will kind of focus on other people that's just my kind of one one lens to it i'm sure that there are other um, reasons why but i think that the whole kind of premise around um, this idea of trying to please other people is because we are taught to respect um, our families and especially our elders and our elders have their have their separate values right and so they try and bring us up based on their own values and so um, when that happens we're constantly trying to like match up to their values which might not match to our own and we're always pressured to to kind of strive for for excellence there is one more um, aspect to it i think as immigrants our parents have had to work twice as hard for everything you know, whether it's studies, whether it's learning the new language of, of the country they're in, or whether, um, whether it's about just being good at the job. 
often people of color have not had the same opportunities as as people who aren't and um, and they've had to work twice as hard and so they expect the same from their kids so they expect their kids to be excelling because they feel like their kids won't have the same opportunities if they don't um, so I think that that is also a big driver for it a lot of people don't know what imposter syndrome is it's that feeling of when you're in a room and um, you feel like you don't belong you feel like you're not qualified enough to be there it could be, you know, in, in, your, in the classroom or it could be in the workplace when you're in front of a client and you're, you know, speaking on a one-to-one -one basis with them and they're asking you questions and you're just thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about. And it happens to everyone and it happens to women so much. Really, I think as a woman of colour, it just comes from what we're taught, again, as, as kids. Um, females are taught to look pretty, sit pretty, uh, play with dolls and everything's just like really pristine and perfect and, and that's how we're expected to conduct our lives whereas um, boys are expected to play in the mud get dirty get like um, just experiment and and fail and fall and get up and have scraped knees and and it's just different I mean I'm not a kid anymore so I don't know what it's like but I know that when I was younger that was the case and so Again, it's, it's that, those values we place in ourselves when, when we're younger, especially as females, to just always strive for 110% for knowledge and perfection and qualification. So if, if I was to apply for a job and if I go on LinkedIn and I look at all of the skills that I need, I'll try and make sure that I fit the bill for that, for all of those skills. Whereas a lot of, typically, I mean, I'm generalizing, but like, a lot of males will look at that and think, oh yeah, I cover most of that, I'm gonna go for it. Like, I'm gonna negotiate a really high salary too. Women don't even, they don't do that. They don't believe in themselves often. And, um, and that is the imposter syndrome. It's when you don't believe in yourself and, and you think that, oh my gosh, someone's gonna find out that um, I've been in this job for so long and, and I shouldn't really be here because I don't know anything. I don't think our communities even know what imposter syndrome is. They feel it, but they don't acknowledge it often. Um, I just think that there is this, this attitude of we just have to keep going, we just have to keep pushing and keep striving for excellence and, um, and sometimes there's just not enough space to, to talk about the little things, you know, the little insecurities that we face, um, whether it's at work, whether it's in our relationships, whether it's with our friends or our families. Um, yeah, there's just not enough conversation about it. I've not heard enough. Um, South Asians talking about imposter syndrome and in fact I didn't even know that it was a term until I read Sheryl Sandberg's book and I was just so moved by it because someone so high up in such a, a big company talking about how she gets scared going into meetings she gets scared to sit at the table um, she gets scared to lean into the conversations and into the work because she just doesn't feel like she belongs there and even like having gone through Harvard and everything I was just very uh, impressed by by how candidly she was able to speak about that and um, I definitely would love to open up more about my imposter syndrome and and how I go through that because there are so many young females I'm sure who are who are kind of looking for that kind of guidance on how should I deal with this how should I you know apply for an investment banking job when I'll be the only female in the firm um, or like on the floor and I won't know I'll be the youngest one and I won't know what to do. And there'll be all these males running around and in their lad culture. So um, from the perspective of female, I think it definitely applies a lot to me, but I'm sure that it applies to everybody in different aspects of their life.